robotics and automotive student from Sarita High School. Your Region 6 president, Lily Truitt. An engineering student from Paradise Valley High School. Your Region 5 president, Sidorshin Kadalzi. A welding student from Mingus Union High School. Your Region 4 president, Josie Boynet. A local app development student from Metro Tech High School. Your Region 2 president, Yesley Martinez. A wealthy student from Popa High School. Your Region 1 president, A graphic design student from Willow Canyon High School.
the 50th annual Skills USA Arizona State Championships. With over 2,700 students and advisors in attendance, competing in more than 70 leadership and skill contests, this is the largest cha championships to date. We would like to extend a special welcome to our special guests who are in attendance at this conference. Please stand to be recognized as your name is called. All of our partners from business and industry, from Skills USA's national office, executive director Mr. Timothy Lawrence, and corporate development officer Mrs. Leslie Lawrence. USA Missouri State Director, Mr. Joey Baker. And Program Specialist, Cindy Gutierrez. Having been involved with SkillsUSA for most of his life, Mr. Timothy Lawrence firmly believes being involved in, being involved in technical education and joining SkillsUSA in high school set his course for a successful future. He worked in both labor and management positions in the industry for nine years while continuing his education. Graduating magna cum laude from James Madison University with a degree in administration and training, he fulfilled one of his life dreams when he became a teacher in Virginia in 1978. He achieved another life goal when he was named the National Trade and Industrial Education Teacher of the Year in 1983. In 1987, he joined the Virginia Department of Education as a career and technical education student specialist and chief executive officer of the State Skills USA organization. He also served other youth initiatives with, his, with the National Safety Council's Youth Division, Students Against Driving Drunk, and numerous community service organizations. In 1996, Mr. Lawrence joined the National Skills USA organization as Business Industries Partnerships Director at National Leadership Center in Leesburg, Virginia. And in January 2001, Mr. Lawrence became the Chief Executive Officer of Skills USA, one of the nation's largest individual membership organizations. In this position, he feels he works for the students and teachers of America's technical education system. And now, we would like to give a warm Arizona welcome to our very own Executive Director, Tim Lawrence. Awesome, thank you. Good evening, SkillJust Arizona. As I flew here from Washington, D.C. yesterday, last night, I thought of what I might say to you. Something that would be impactful, something we would remember. And it really came down to two simple words. And those words are thank you. Thank you for stepping up. Thank you for stepping out. Thank you for being champions at work. Thanks to Robin Crumbaugh, our state director. Thanks to Cindy from the Arizona Department of Education. Thanks to all the board members and all the volunteers that are making this possible for you. The future of America's workforce, the future in your communities, and the future of our great nation. Thank you, especially to the students. Thank you. And I want to talk about these four topics. Build, being a champion, what does it mean to be a champion? Building your brand, your own leadership brand, your future, and then one of my favorite characters, Batman. So, I want to do that, but I forgot something down here. So, hold on. So first, if I ask you, are you ready, kid? So loyal, it's unbelievable how loyal he is. So SpongeBob is happy, 
and SpongeBob is loyal. That's his brand. That's his personal brand. Think about what your brand is. Think about when you walk into a room and someone sees your face, does it think happy? Does it think loyal? Your friends, your family, your parents, your grandparents, your peers, what do they think your brand is? Think about that. So think about your vision for the future. Think about your personal brand. Think about what success means to you. And I know you're here for a special reason. You're here, really, in my opinion, because destiny has brought you here, and your skills have too, but there's something special that happens here that brought you all together. 2,700 people gathering in Phoenix for this 50th anniversary event. And by the way, happy birthday. You're a part of the winning organization, the state officer team who just came on stage. Let's give them another big round of applause. Spans this nation. This year, there are 335,000 students involved, and for the first time in our history, we will reach nearly 400,000 members. In the past 52 years, we've served 13 million students, and I'm proud that I was one of those growing up in Southern West Virginia. I was a welding student, and I was a member of this organization. But if you think about, whoo, did you hear that? It comes out sometimes. If you think about this birthday cake, you would think that a 50th anniversary would have 50 candles. A cake would have 50 candles. But you thought of SkillSwiss Arizona, back in 1967 when you were founded, you were started with 40 students. 40 members joined this organization. This year alone, this academic year, over 14,000. Congratulations, SkillSwiss Arizona. Thank you. Thank you for part of this legacy that you built. 50 years of excellence, 50 years of champions. And if this cake, if this cake had the true number of candles on it, it would light the world. It would burn this place down because Nashville would have 13 million candles and Arizona would have hundreds of thousands of candles. It would be a heck of a kick. So, think about your future. Back to your future begins right here, right now. Today is an opportunity and I hope you'll use this event here in Phoenix this week as a springboard for your future. This could be your future. You could be going over the high bar and trying or you could be this guy. <laughs> Don't be that guy. You want to be her, not him. So, think about your future. And there's never been a better time to be skilled. If you have the leadership and technical skills, and you have the skills that will help meet this issue that the nation and the world has called the skills gap, your future is bright. Because you see that line on the top represents the labor needed. The red line on the bottom represents the labor that's available through the year 2030. So students, you have the skills to pay the bills. You've got a, a great future ahead of you if you just continue to pursue your technical pathway. And the framework that SkillsUSA has developed helps you do that. Personal, workplace, and technical skills grounded in academics. Hope you'll follow that, path, that pathway and that framework throughout the rest of your life because it will make you successful. But your time is now. This is your time. Your time to seize the opportunity. Your time to plan your future. And the work of champions. We'll talk a little about that. Some of you are going to come on this stage tomorrow and receive gold medals. And those that do are going to come to Louisville in June, the last full week of June, and you're going to compete with 6,300 students on 20 football fields of floor space, and American Business and Industry is going to donate around $36 million for you for that competition. They're doing it because they believe that you're their future. But a true champion is not necessarily the one, although a champion does wear the gold medal and the silver and the bronze. I competed back in my high school days. I didn't win the gold. I didn't win the silver. I didn't win the bronze. But I won a golden opportunity because a true champion is someone who stands up for something who has a cause, who has something to stand up for daily, who works every day, works hard, stands on principle, and always works to do the right thing. That's what a true champion is. So I want to tell you, if you competed today or if you're competing tomorrow, whether you wear a gold medal home or not, if you've come to Phoenix and you've done your absolute best, you will leave this city a true champion forever. Absolutely. special shout out to a group of people that are here that brought you here or as we say in West Virginia who brought you these people brought you to Phoenix and those are your advisors they shape the future every day advisors instructors would you stand for just a moment and students let's show them how you program. Everywhere I go, everywhere I speak, that's the group of heroes that always gets the largest round of applause. Thank you so much for being the inspiration. So if you think about your advisor or your instructor as Patrick. Who's that guy on the bottom? What kind of creature is he? He's a starfish. 
So think of him as your advisor or your instructor, always carrying you on their shoulders, always has your back, you're riding on top, right? So think of your advisor that way. And then finally, one last point I want to make. Can you win in Skills USA? You already have. And that's when I think about this guy, my favorite character, Batman. He has such cool toys. Batmobile, Bat, Batcopter, Batboat. He has, he, has, he, has a, he has a bat everything, I guess. But he's got cool toys, but at the same time, you think about the movie Batman Begins. When young Bruce Wayne was walking through the garden, he fell into the hole, he fell into a cave, and he's swarmed by millions of bats. Later became the Bat King. But as his father and the butler picked him up out of the hole, they asked him a question. He was okay, he didn't break anything. He asked, why did we fall? What was the answer? To pick ourselves back up again. So, students, one, one thing I want you to remember, if you remember nothing else I say today, we all fall. You may fall in a competition, you may fall in a relationship, you may fall financially, we all fall. The secret to success is picking yourself back up again. And I'll tell you this, every morning, something magical happens. You've gotta to live to see that morning. So I, I attend too many memorial services or I see too many students taking, um, actually doing harm to themselves or someone else, even suicide sometimes. And I've been to those memorial services. But I guarantee you if you'll do this for me, I promise me you'll do this above all else. If you ever get into a situation where you've fallen, and you don't feel you can pick yourself back up again, and everything just seems dark. It's always darkest before the dawn. And I promise you, if you'll wait, time heals everything. If you'll wait and you'll stand and face the east, every morning something magical happens because of a higher power, the sun rises in the east. And if you just give it time, it will shine on your face again, just like this light shining on mine now. Give it time, let the sun shine on your face again. Always pick yourself back up. And then finally, the damsel was falling off the tall building in, in Gotham City to her demise, and all of a sudden, out of the dark, these giant black wings swooped down. <laughs> she heard the flutter of the wings. He picked her up with his cables and his pulleys. He, 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 he brought her back to the top of the skyscraper. That's her laying in the middle, looking up at Batman, and she asked the question, who are you? What was the answer? <laughs> no, it's not I'm Batman, although he was. <laughs> The answer was, it's not who we are, but what we do that defines us. So students, it doesn't matter what kind of family you come from, it doesn't matter if your face is black, white, brown, or green, it doesn't matter what kind of shoes you wear, what kind of clothing you have, what your academic report looks like, it's what you do from this day forward that will define you. So remember that, pick yourself back up again, two great lessons in the Batman movie. Pick yourself back up again no matter what, give yourself time, face the east, let the sun shine on your face, and always know that what you do will define you for the rest of your life. It will also define your family, it will define your community, and it will define our nation. So, build your brand, leave a legacy. And who's this guy? Plankton. What's his brand? What's the one word you think of? Evil. Evil. So, he's, um, he's always after something. What is it? He's always after the formula. So he's a thief, so his brand is evil. He's a thief. What's his real name? Sheldon. Sheldon, you got it. His name is Sheldon. You guys do know SpongeBob. But don't be that brand. You remember the episode, well this is this is Plankton trying to steal the Krabby Patty recipe recipe. You remember the episode called Plankton's Army? When he brought all the plankton from the seven seas together to steal the recipe. How do you remember that? It aired in like 2003. So reruns, right? But don't be a part of this army, don't be a part of this brand. Be a part of this army. Be a part of SpongeBob's army. Be happy, be loyal, build a legacy. All right. And a final request, my final final, continue this journey. There's an organization called the Alumni. They're strong here in Arizona. This is the group over the past 50 years that's been coming back every year and they're standing behind this stage right now assisting with the AV, assisting with everything we're doing. They're all over this hall, all over these convention center hallways helping you, supporting you. Come back and help. Continue the journey. Join the alumni. It's free. Go online and do it if you're graduating this year or do it before you graduate. We'd love to have you involved. We'll stay in touch with you. We'll send you a newsletter every quarter. We'll keep you in touch with the national organization and with the state association. So continue this journey. So, your time is now. You've chosen a great pathway. Know what you want to do. Build your skills. Fulfill your responsibility. Do the right thing. Always do the right thing. Lead the way and be a champion. And 
I always remember during this conference, especially, to have fun. What's your name? Shout out your name. Wrong. Everyone's wearing a name badge, right? Your name badge now says, hello, I'm awesome. Turn to the person beside you and tell them who you are. Tell them you're awesome. Introduce yourself. All right. I want to thank you again. I started with two words. I'll end with two words. Thank you. Thank you, SkillsUSA Arizona. Congratulations. Congratulations on 50 years. 50 years is a long time for any organization. You're doing something right here in Arizona. And I can tell you the students I've met so far, and I, I hope I can meet all of you before I leave tomorrow. You've been absolutely awesome. You really are. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Lawrence. And to everyone here, thank you for attending our state championships. Everyone look to your left. Now look to your right. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we are making history. Today, we are all a part of a historic moment here at SkillsUSA Arizona. Today marks our 50th anniversary of hard work and dedication to becoming the future. With everyone here in attendance and with all that we plan to accomplish, we are a solid depiction of students, teachers, and industry leaders working together to bring forward the next generation of industry professionals. The next generation of leaders. Individually, you all have chosen to be a part of something that has put you far ahead of where you used to be. Think back to your individual struggles that you have, had to over that you have overcome. Think back to all the big dreams that you have aspired to chase. Think back to the goals that you had set and have now accomplished. This is the result of your action to create a better future for yourselves. This is where your journey has brought you. This is your success. However, do not think that this is, that this is the end. Because every individual always has room to grow. Let everyone today see your strengths and take time to learn from your weaknesses. Collectively, let us all do what we can to mark today as a, memor as a memorable 50th anniversary of the change that Skills USA has made for all of us. awards nine $1,000 scholarships each year to members of Skills USA. It is our mission to provide an environment that enables every student to develop leadership skills, career preparation skills, job skills, and an attitude for success. This scholarship may be used for post-secondary education or tools of the trade. This year's recipients are Lindsay Hazlitt, Estrella Foothills High School. Bronze. West Mech Surprise Campus. 
West Mech Northwest Campus. Chapter Distinction Silver. Poston Butte High School. Shadow Mountain High School. Estrella Foothills High School. Chapter of Distinction Gold. Vista Grande High School. Buena High School. Kofa High School. La Jolla Community High School. River Valley High School. Central Arizona Valley Institute of Technology. the Eagle Trophy, to display at their school for the following year. Scoring 293 out of 300 points, the chapter receiving Jefferson for the 2017 to 2018 school year is Central Arizona Valley Institute of Technology. everyone to stand up. All right. So, when I say we are, what should you say? We are. We are. Okay, that's weak, guys. I know you're in high school. I know you have a voice. We are. We are. All right. Go ahead and give your your neighbor a high five. You can go ahead and have a You see other students, you see teachers, you see industry. You are all here for a purpose. You are all here for a reason. That purpose is to change America. 
You made the decision to be part of Skills USA to pave a path for your future. How many of you competed today by show of hands? How many of you are competing tomorrow? The nerves, the hours that you've spent, we have been preparing all year for this moment, right? You haven't been preparing for this? Yeah! All right. I want you to take a look around, though. These students, you, for the past 50 years, Skills USA Arizona, all of the people before you, all of the people that are yet to come, you guys are making the difference in today's workforce. You're getting prepared during high school so that you are, you are career ready by the time you graduate. You're ready to fill that skills gap that as people are beginning to retire, you can just come in and fill those positions. How cool is that to know that by the time you graduate high school that you're ready to go out to the workforce? How cool is that? You don't have to spend an extra four years in college. You're, you're ready. I think that's pretty awesome. And advisors, can advisors please stand? don't even know what skills you're saying or they they're maybe they're like oh yeah you're you're going to compete I don't really know what that's about but to you you're taking the first step in creating your future so remember nothing can stop you nothing can be in your path so continue creating that future for yourself thank you Thank you, Ms. Cromwell. One of the highlights of the championships is the elections of this year's new state officer team that we represent over 14,000 Arizona members. It is a substantial commitment that comes with many rewarding opportunities, which include intense leadership training, Arizona representation at the National Leadership and Skills Conference in Louisville, Kentucky, conducting business and industry visits, and being a key part of Skills USA Arizona conferences. Candidates are to be commended for their decision to pursue an office. We would like to recognize this year's state officer candidates. For Region President, Adrian Balderrama. <laughs> Nayan Peru Pampa. Josie Boynton, Jack Baham, and Andrew Heinrich. For at large, Taylor Lopez, Duncan Schultz, Ashley Wilking, Kate Bolthrop, Derek Wolf, Justin Suarez, Kasab Kalabelzi, Osmar Valenzuela, 
Rafael Ramirez, Ziamara Garza, <laughs> Brandon Orpresa, and Melissa Morano. These candidates will spend tomorrow afternoon giving speeches and campaigning for their office. Winners will be announced at tomorrow's closing session. On behalf of the retiring state officer team, we wish these candidates the best of luck. Advisors are a key component in Skills USA. They seek success for each of their students, and their hard work and dedication to their classrooms is truly astonishing. The Advisor of the Year Recognition Award was developed so that others can recognize the advisors who have gone above and beyond the call of duty. Today, we will recognize the advisors who have been nominated for this award and award the Advisor of the Year 2016-2017. The advisors who have been nominated for this award are Andrew Lamer. After, after great evaluation and consideration for the nominations submitted, an advisor stood out above the rest through his dedication and commitment to his students. The advisor was a, this advisor was a graduate from Mingus Union High School and continued his education at Wyoming Technical Institute and returned to Mingus Union to become a welding instructor. And in 2007, he became an advisor for Skills USA. Today, he also serves as the regional coordinator. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me congratulate Skills USA Arizona's Advisor of the Year 2016-2017 school year, Mr. Andrew Lamer from Mingus Union High School. Congratulations. for everything he does for me as a student. <laughs> Our speaker today has been working with students ever since he was a student. He's spoken to teenagers across the United States and he once talked to a guy in Canada. He's given talks to thousands of students, published numerous articles in teen magazines, and even taught himself how to do a cartwheel. When he's not speaking, he's hanging out with his family in Missouri and trying to keep his kids from climbing the bookshelves. Please welcome our keynote speaker, Mr. Kyle Sheely. Thank you. How are you guys doing? I want to tell you a story. When I was in high school, I was in student council, and one day we put on this entire day of events. It was called Every 15 Minutes. Some of you may have heard it, it's still hacked across the country. And every 15 minutes, it's been going on for about 20 years, and it's a day of events that takes place on a high school campus that's designed to drive home the statistic that every 15 minutes, someone in the United States dies of an alcohol in a car accident. And so at the beginning of the day, they staged the car accident in front of our school, and then throughout the day, they had different uh, activities and, and things going on. And the culmination of the event, though, was at the end of the day, they had an assembly. And in this assembly, they held a funeral for one of our fellow students, as though one of our fellow students had died. And we all knew that this girl was still alive, but they wanted us to feel, what would it be like if you were to see one of your friends, um, you know, dead in a casket because of uh, a drunk driver? The only weird thing was that this funeral, they had her, her friends and her family and parents and stuff come up on stage and they're talking about her and they're all crying. We all knew that she is still alive, but it was very emotional. But the weird thing was there was a real casket on the stage, a real coffin, and she was really in it. So she just had to lay there for like 45 minutes just trying not to move. But I got out of class the entire day because I was in student council and I was helping put on this event. And uh, what usually happens when that happens is they give you a job and you have like five or ten minutes in between and then you do something else and where they'll say, okay, I, you're done with this job, now wait, uh, and grab another person. So there's a lot of waiting around and during one of these periods of waiting, my, my advisor said, go wait for the coffin to get here. So grab another person, it's a heavy coffin, it's big, 
they bring out a two meter lift. And so we go, I grab my friend Andrew, we head backstage. At the back of our stage, there's probably one of the back of this auditorium, there's a big garage door that goes directly outside. And so that you can bring in props and lumber and stuff like that. And so we're waiting by this garage door, and sure enough, a couple minutes in, and you're bang, bang, bang. We roll up the garage door, and there's the coffin delivery man, or whatever his job title was. <laughs> and he's standing there, and he's looking flustered. You ever see somebody, and you're like, this guy's not having a good day. That's what this guy looked like. He's just checking his watch. He's like, oh my gosh, I'm like, I've got to go to this other place, and I'm running late, and I'm not even sure I'm on the right spot. I got this coffin off, and he's just saying all this stuff. And I was like, dude, it's cool, you're in the right spot. I, I, I thought I could take this coffin, so I sat up in the coffin. And he actually unloaded it on this rolling cart. So actually, we thought we would need two of us to carry it, but it was really easy to roll around. It's just on this cart. And so I'm like, cool. So we roll the coffin inside, we shut the door, and he leaves. Actually, he left before we shut the door, otherwise he would just run into the door. So he leaves, we shut the door, and, uh, and then I tell my friend Andrew, Andrew, actually, I don't need you now because I thought we were going to have to carry this coffin. So why don't I blow this thing up to the front of the stage, and then you go tell Mr. Kinsel that it's here. That'll save us a little bit of time. So he said, cool, I'll do that. You do that. Team on three. One, two, three, team. We didn't really do that. There's just two of us. That would be dumb. So he leaves, and I roll the coffin up. The coffin is now sitting up here on stage. And now it's just me and the coffin. Do you ever have one of those ideas? <laughs> and like right away, you know two things about the idea. First of all, you're like, this is a terrible idea and I should not do it. And second of all, you're like, I'm definitely going to do it. So I open the coffin and I climb inside and close the lids. And I'm thinking this is going to be so great. I'm leaning, I'm so proud of myself. You know, I just get really excited about your own idea. You're like, oh, this is going to be awesome. I was thinking my teacher's going to come back. He's going to wonder where I'm at. I'm going to joke out of the coffin and scare him. It'll be a great memory. Um, but I forgot how far away his classroom was, and so I was like, I forgot how long it would take Andrew to get all the way down there and back. So I was laying in the coffin for a really long time, just thinking about my life. But eventually, I hear footsteps coming back, but it was too many footsteps, you know, because I thought Andrew and Mr. Kinsel would come back and would just be the two of them, and I, we'd have, you know, kind of a little intimate time, and they would be, where's Colin? It would just be us, and so it wouldn't be that big of a deal. But I forgot that Mr. Kinsel was teaching a class that hour. And so when Andrew went to get him, he said, oh, good, class, the coffee's here, that's what we've been waiting for. Now we can start getting ready for this. So everyone come down. So he had, you know, 30 students grab their stuff. They all come down to the auditorium. And he said, you can just work quietly on some other homework in the auditorium. Or you can, you know, help us get set up for the assembly. So they all get in there and they're like, their choices. Why can do my coffin? So we're quite people looking at this coffin on stage. So they all choose to go look at the coffin. So now instead of Andrew and Mr. Kinslow on stage, now it's like Andrew, Mr. Kinslow, and 30 students. That was stage one of where my plans started to fall apart. Stage two is this. I thought Mr. Kinsel would walk up, flip on the lid, and whoa, I just jump back for half a second, but then quickly realize it was me, and you know, he can see my face, and, and he knew what my face looked like. But I forgot that this, lock, this coffin actually had two lids. It had one lid that covered your face, and it had one lid that covered your feet. And my dude flipped open the wrong lid. <laughs> so instead of saying, he had flipped open the lid, my plan would have been great. He would have said, ah, I just jumped for half a second. But instead, he flips open the lid covering my feet, and he sees my feet, and he was really familiar with my face. But he wasn't like super familiar with my feet, or how my feet look any different from anyone else's feet. So he just sees their feet in his coffin, and he doesn't think, oh, that's probably Kyle. He thinks, they sent us the wrong coffin. <laughs> and in the back of his mind, he's like, somewhere there's a funeral happening right now, and they're just putting an empty box into the ground. <laughs> and inside the coffin, I look down, I see this light coming in around my ankles, and I was like, oh, no. <laughs> and then he says, oh, no, too, except he said it like a thousand times. He's like, no, 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 no. He's just backing up, no, 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 And I was sitting inside the coffin. Um, I'm sitting there, I'm hearing him say this, and then all of the 30 students, they see him just kind of backing up, and they're all like, what's going on? So they look in the coffin, and 30 students all at once go, <gasps> just sucks all the air right out of the room. And inside the coffin, I was like, this is my moment. <laughs> so I push open the lid, and I was like, Whoa! And I have never seen a teacher's face go from so white to so red in such a short period of time. He went from being scared to death to like having death in his mind. He was like, you want me in a coffin? I'll put you in a coffin. <laughs> I tell that story for two reasons. One, because it's hilarious. And two, because it illustrates a good point, which is that oftentimes in life we're afraid of things that aren't really worth being afraid of. Oftentimes we're afraid of something because somebody else made us afraid of those things and we've never considered that they can actually hurt us or not. When I was growing up, um, I was known as a funny guy. And so when I became a speaker, I just kind of stayed with that. And so if you've seen me speak in the last seven years, this is my seventh year of speaking, for the first five or six years, if you were to ask me, hey, uh, tell me about Kyle, have you seen Kyle speak? They would go, oh, Kyle's funny. Kyle's funny because I like telling jokes like that, I like telling stories like that, I like making people laugh, I like making people smile. And I think that laughter is an underrated thing. I think that uh, if you can make someone laugh, you can make someone smile, you can pull them out of a dark time. Um, but I think because of that, maybe I've been scared, maybe I've been afraid to talk about any parts of my story that were funny. 
and even would have made somebody laugh. But I'm not afraid of that anymore. Guys, when I was growing up, I went to a tiny little school. It was like, it's not this big. And uh, it was hard to fit in. It is. Anyways. Uh, it's a terrible joke. No, it was a regular size, you know, like doors and windows and stuff. Um, but it was a small school. There was about 20 kids in my class. And I did not feel like I fit in. I fit in the building fine. It was, you know, structurally sound. But I didn't fit in with the kids. I didn't fit in with the teachers. I got sent to the office every year of my school from the time that I was in kindergarten all the way through my, the time I graduated high school. I probably would have gotten sent to college, but then I would have sent to the office in college. I got sent to the office in kindergarten, guys. That's a hard merit badge to earn, but I earned it. And I never got sent to the office for anything bad. I wasn't like killing anybody or starting gangs or anything like that. I was just like a kid who couldn't pay attention very well. And I didn't feel like I didn't feel like I fit in with the teachers. I didn't feel like I fit in with the kids. I would have kids over my house. I wasn't bullied or anything. I just didn't feel like I made any deep connections there. I would have students over my house, and, and they'd spend the night. It was fun. It would seem like they had a really good time, but then they would never like invite me to their house. So I'd have them back over my house, and then they like wouldn't invite me over to their house. And I remember just thinking, like, this is kind of weird. So finally, in about third grade, I cornered this kid on the playground. I was like, dude, we need to talk. What's going on? Yeah, I don't think friendship has to be like a one for one even trade. Like it's not you know keeping records or whatever. But it seems a little weird that I've had you over to my house a bunch of times, and according to my records, you've had me over approximately zero times. Let's get what gives. And he said, Oh man, I want to have you over, but I can't. And I was like, Oh, you should have just said that. Maybe you can't have people over. Some people just don't have people over. Maybe your house is too small. Maybe your kid, parents don't like kids running around. That's fine. You just can't have people over. He said, No, no, no. I'm sorry. I can have people over. I can't have you over. And I was like, Oh. Why? And he said, my mom says you're dangerous, you're too crazy, you're not welcome in our house. Yeah, you know, thank you. And when somebody says something like that to you in life, you're supposed to act like it doesn't get to you, right? You're supposed to act like that doesn't bother you at all, so, you know, you're tough, nothing can get to you. And so he was like, my mom says you're too crazy, I was just like, she's right, man. I break your house down. But inside, that's not how I felt. Inside, I was just like bummed out because I... I was just a kid who wanted to be loved. I just was a kid who wanted a friend. And here's this, this person telling me, you're not welcome in my house, you're dangerous. And so I remember thinking, I don't fit in with any of these kids. And it wasn't a big step from the idea that I don't fit in with these kids, the idea that maybe I don't fit in with any kids. Because even though there was only 20 kids in my class, it seemed like everyone else had found their person. Everyone else found their little group they clicked with. They, they were doing great, but I, I just didn't fit in with anybody. So I was like, maybe I don't just fit in, not just fit in with these kids, maybe I don't fit in anywhere. And it wasn't a big step from that idea to the idea that maybe the world would be better off if I wasn't here. And I remember in third grade and fourth grade thinking about how would a third grader take his life? How would a fourth grader kill himself? But then fifth grade came. And in fifth grade, Zach showed up and everything changed. Zach was my boy. Like right away, I was like, that's the guy we waited for. Zach was my best friend day one. I just knew. Zach was like me. Zach didn't uh, have a filter between his brain and his mouth. Zach was sarcastic. Zach didn't have a lot of energy. Before Zach got there, it was like, Kyle, out of the hall. Now I was like, Zach, Kyle, out of the hall. I said, dude, we can do whatever we want out here. Those suckers are learning in there. Everything changed when Zach showed up. I remember a couple weeks after school started, Zach was like, do you want to come over to my house sometime? And inside, I was like, just play cool. Don't show him that you've never wanted anything more in your life. Then to go to somebody's house. So I was like, sure, you don't come to your house. You insist, you know? <laughs> what do you think? And it's because I have two brothers, and our house is always a disaster. Like, we'd make a huge mess, and I'd be like, Mom, our, our house is messy. And she would be like, yeah, you did that. Clean it up. I was like, you seem to be at an impasse here. And so when I want to have people over, I'd be like, Mom, let's have people over. She's like, all right, let's look at like June. And I was like, it's January right now, Mom. And she was like, I know, it's going to take some time. OK, we've got to find the floor, figure out where that's at. Um, so when Zach at the beginning of school said, do you want to go over to my house sometime? I was like, yeah, man, what do you think? Like, February? And he was like, it's August. And I was like, you're right, March is probably better. And he was like, no, I was thinking August. Like, do you want to go over today? And I was like, you can do that. You can have someone over to your house to say that maybe you have the idea to have them over to your house. That was just like new information for me, and my brain could not handle it. And he said, well, I mean, I'll have to ask my mom, I'm sure it'll be fine. So after school, he goes up to his mom's car, he's like, hey, mom, can you have to come over to my house? Or our house wasn't his house, he was in fifth grade. Uh, he said, can you have to come over tonight? And she said, well, I'll have to ask his mom. So his people call my people, lawyers, contracts, documents, lots of facts is going on, you know? And so uh, she says, yeah, so I come over to his house. Keep in mind, the fifth grade never been invited to anyone's house before. So I'm thinking it's going to be a trial run. I've actually been told I'm too dangerous to come to some people's house, so I'm like, this is going to be a trial run. They probably won't actually let me in the house. They'll probably put me in the grass the first time. Give me like a bowl of water and like a piece of bread and just, you know, see how it goes. Like when you're potty training a dog, you don't just let it run everywhere right away. So like, if I behave over the first night, then they'll let me into the kitchen in the morning, right? But that's not how it went. I came in, 
uh, you know, right away. I like, went inside. I was like, whoa, cool. So I go inside, and then I was like, do you want a sandwich? And I said, yes. And she made me the sandwich. It was called peanut butter and honey. She put peanut butter on a piece of bread. She put honey on a piece of bread. They came together. Oh, a light shone out of heaven. It was amazing. I took one bite. My brain just like exploded. I was like, what is this sandwich? It's amazing. And also, why have my parents been holding out on I me? Mean, we had the ingredients for this the whole time. <laughs> Anyways, I had the sandwich, it was amazing. I had a glass of milk, then she said, Kyle, make yourself at home. Here's the pantry, get anything you want. Here's the fridge, get anything you want. Here's the TV, change the channels, do whatever you want. There's the thermostat, set the temperature, make yourself comfortable, change our outgoing voicemail message. Whatever you want, make yourself at home. <laughs> See, Zach's mom didn't treat me like I was some dangerous problem child. Zach's mom didn't even treat me like I was one of her kid's friends. She just treated me like I was one of her kids. And so for the next four or five years, when I wasn't at my house, it was probably at Zach's house. Zach's family became my second family. Now, I have a great family. I wasn't running from anything. I didn't have anything, but it's, Zach's family became my second family. I lived there like half the time. I was always at his house. I basically just built my own addition on the back. I was like, this is my room now. I had my phone line installed, you know, routed my mail there. That's not true, but it could have been. Like one time, Zach's mom was like, hey, Kyle, we're going to be gone for a couple weeks. We're going on vacation as a family. Um, I, you know, we're going to Florida and stuff. And I was like, well, you keep using words like we and like family. And those make it sound like I should be there because I feel like I'm part of your family. And she was like, OK, fine. So I went to Florida with Zach's family <laughs> twice. <laughs> Zach and I became best friends. And, and everything. All those thoughts about I don't belong here, all those thoughts about how would a third or fourth grader kill himself, all that stuff just evaporated. But you know what's crazy is that nothing else really changed. Like when I was in that dark spot in my life, your executive director was just talking about that. You, you just need to stay, just, just know that the sun's gonna come up again, but I never thought it would. I was in that dark spot and I remember thinking like, everything's gonna have to change. All of these kids are gonna have to be replaced with different kids who like me. All of these teachers are gonna have to be replaced with teachers who understand me, and that will never ever happen. And so that's why I was just despairing in that place. But all it took was one person. See, Zach showed me it only takes one person to make you feel like you matter. It only takes one person to make you feel like you belong. It only takes one person to make you feel like you're accepted. Unfortunately, then high school came. And in high school, um, Zach and I had to go separate ways because the private school that we went to only went up to eighth grade. And Zach and I lived in different school districts. And so he went to one school, I went to another school in a different town. And we stayed in touch and stuff. But this is like before cell phones because I'm an old person. And you know, we we're trying to send pigeons back and forth. And they're just get, getting shot down, you know? <laughs> Telegraphs just weren't, you know, what they are today. And so, now I'm starting over again. And now I'm at a school, instead of 20 kids that I don't know, there's like 200 kids that I don't know. And I just, again, feel like I don't fit in with these kids. And see, Zach showed me it only takes one person to make you feel like you matter. Sean showed me it only takes one person to make you feel like you don't. Sean was this kid, I don't know what I ever did to him, but he just didn't like me day one. He just decided. And it wasn't something I, like, kind of picked up on. Sometimes you're like, I don't think that guy likes me. No, he just told me, Kyle, I don't like you. Cool, thanks, Sean. <laughs> You actually told me that 10 minutes ago, but thanks for the update. I appreciate you letting me know. If you like me, because you, you know, about every 10 or 15 minutes, you would let me know. I still don't like you. And he wasn't content to just not like me himself. He also wanted other people not to like me. So like, he would tell stories about me that made me sound like I was a loser. Like one time, I was climbing up in this tree in our courtyard to get a frisbee down, and somebody got me stuck up there. Sean walks out, sees me up in the tree, realizes I'm a sitting duck, takes a rock, and just starts throwing rocks at my head. You ever gotten punched in the nose? Who here has ever gotten punched in the nose before? It's terrible, right? And what happens? You start, it's not really crying. Like it's, it's, you're not crying like you're in pain. Just water comes out of your face when you get hit in the nose. That's just an, a trick. If you, you guys live in Arizona, okay? So if you're ever in the desert, you get lost, you're about to die of thirst, just punch your friend in the nose. Water will come out, you'll be saved. All right, that's how you do it. Survival tip. So I get hit in the face with a rock, and I wasn't crying, but just like it hurt, and a piece, just one, a piece of water, a drop of water, one drop came out, one tear, and I wiped it away. Sean saw that from the ground and goes, "Look at him, he's crying!" And he ran off and he told everyone, and then he would tell that story all the time. Hey, Kyle, remember that time you were crying? I was like, "Yeah, you left out the part of that story where you hit me in the face with a rock, Sean." But he would tell that all the time, and Sean just made my life horrible. I was like, "I don't know what I ever did to this guy." See, Zach showed me it only takes one person to make you feel like you matter, and Sean showed me that it only takes one person to make you feel like you don't. And all of a sudden, I was back in that place again, feeling like I don't belong here. Maybe that thing with Zach was just a fluke. Maybe that was the only person who's ever gonna get me, and now he's at a different school, and our pigeons are getting shot down, and what am I gonna do? Zach showed me it only takes one person to make you feel like you matter. Sean showed me it only takes one person to make you feel like you don't. And then Travis showed me it only takes one person to stand up for another person. Travis was my older brother. Actually, Travis is still my older brother. That's how it works. Uh, <laughs> I've not found a way to catch up with that dude yet. 
He's always two years ahead of me. And Zach, Travis um, was a sophomore, or sorry, was a junior when I was a freshman. And so when I uh, was going through all this, Travis was a junior, and he had already kind of like made his way in high school. He was on the varsity football team. He had his group of friends. Like everything was going okay for him. But just because Travis was doing okay didn't mean that like that automatically meant that I was doing okay. But Travis was helpful in certain situations. Travis was on the varsity football team. Travis was six foot four, and at the time weighed about 350 pounds. He's a big dude. Travis is helpful in certain situations. You're like, dude, we can't get in here. This door is locked. And Travis is like, what door? <laughs> and it's just like a Travis-shaped hole in the wall. You're like, all right, that'll do. Travis was helpful with this Sean thing because um, Sean looked up to Travis. Sean and Travis both played the same position, but Travis played it in varsity and Tra Sean played it in junior varsity. Sean also looked up to Travis because Travis is six foot four and Sean's like five foot negative eight. <laughs> So Sean just looked up to Travis like this, and one day Travis walks into our locker room, and our locker room was shaped like an L, so like if you were in the back and somebody was in the front, you like wouldn't know that person was there. And so Sean was in the back telling some story about me, probably the one about where I got hit in the face of the rock and started crying. And uh, Travis walks in and hears him telling the story, and he just kind of lets him tell the story because he's standing around the corner just waiting for him to realize that Travis is there. So Travis slowly walks around the corner, and Sean is like, oh, end of story, I gotta go. And Travis kind of steps in his way and he's like, what was that story you were telling, Sean? That's kind of weird. It sounded like it was about Kyle. And Sean was like, no, no, a different guy. His name is um, Tile. His, yeah, his parents did, didn't love him. I don't know. Anyways, John's like trying to get out of there. Travis like, it sounds like you were talking about Kyle. And he's like, you know, while we're on the subject of Kyle, I've heard that some people don't like Kyle. And John's like, no, 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 I like Kyle. He's like, I'm one of my favorite people in the world. Like, top three. It's like Gandhi, Martin Luther King, and Kyle, right? Like, just... No, 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 Kyle's actually number one. You know, he just keeps backtracking and he's just, you can tell he's scared. And Travis goes, you know, Sean, that's, that's cool. I'm glad that you like him. But I've heard that some people don't like Kyle. And that... Have you ever loved somebody, Sean? Have you ever like really care about somebody and there's another person that doesn't like that person? How does that make you feel? And Sean was like, sad? And Travis was like, angry. <laughs> Travis goes, maybe you could tell the people who don't like Kyle that I'm angry, Sean. Sean's like, yeah, I'll let him know. I'll definitely tell him, you know? And he's like, oh, while you're at it, tell him one more thing. Tell him I'm not afraid to go to prison. <laughs> Sean never bothered me again after that. They never found Sean's body either. Um, no, now, obviously I just made a joke about murdering a bully, but that's not, I want to make this really clear. Um, I actually don't hold anything against that guy. I did for a long time, because he made my life really hard, and, and that's a hard thing to deal with, and he picked on me for no real discernible reason. But as I've gone on through life, I've realized, especially as I travel all over the country, this is my job, I've met students all over the country, I was on 135 airplanes last year, just going one place to another to another, and the more people I meet, the more stories I hear, I realize the truth of this statement that hurt people hurt people. Hurt people hurt people. You've probably heard that before, and I had heard it when I was in high school, but it didn't really mean anything until I started realizing that I was seeing it everywhere. And my guess is that Sean, in his life, somebody was hurting him. Somebody was telling him he was worthless. Somebody was telling him he was a loser. Somebody was telling him he was garbage, he was trash, and he, they handed him this pain, and he wasn't built to deal with that, because none of us are. And so he said, I don't, I don't want this, and he gave it to me. You're supposed to hope for your bullies. People always say, I hope that somebody put him in his place. Right? That's what you're supposed to say. And I do hope that somebody put Sean in his place, but I hope it was a place where he was loved. I hope somebody put Sean in a place where he finally felt like he mattered and he was loved and accepted and he didn't have to do that anymore. I, think, I hope somebody finally sat him down and goes, dude, you're, I like you the way you are. You don't have to do that to that guy. I have no negative feelings towards Sean. But Sean showed me some stuff. See, Travis showed me that it only takes one person to stand up for someone. Sean showed me it only takes one person to make you feel like you don't matter. Zach showed me it only takes one person to make you feel like you do. And as I've gone on through life, I've realized it only takes one person to do almost anything. Like, almost anything worth doing can be done by one person. It all boils down to individual people, but we don't like to focus on that. We like to focus on big organizations, big groups, big events, big fundraisers, big conventions. All that stuff is great. But all those things fall apart without individual people in them. SkillsUSA isn't a thing, it doesn't exist, it's just a name for all of the people that are in it. And as soon as every one of you stops being in SkillsUSA and all of the millions of people across the nation just say, I don't want to do it anymore, SkillsUSA isn't, like an, or, isn't a, an entity. It just ceases to exist. It only exists because individuals are a part of it. We focus on these big events, we focus on these big things, but oftentimes the things that make the biggest difference aren't those things. They're the intimate moments between you and another person where somebody looks at you and says, hey, I care about you. Hey, you matter to me. And if you don't believe me, then do this experiment. Go into a nursing home sometime. Find somebody who's like 80, 90 years old and ask them three questions for me. Question number one, say, who's somebody that believed in you when you were a kid? What's that person's name or what's something they said to you that, that showed you that you mattered? And that 80 or 90 year old person will quote somebody from 75, 80 years ago and they will quote it word for word what that person said. They'll say, Mr. So-and-so, my third grade teacher, or Mrs. whatever. And they looked at me and they said this. And they'll remember those words decades and decades later. And then ask them, question number two, say, what some jerk, something some jerk said to you when you were 10, and they will know it word for word. Those words stick with us. 
Then ask them question number three. Say, what was the theme of your junior prom? <laughs> They'll go, what the, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> but we focus more on that, don't we? Focus more on this stuff that is fleeting, that is passing, and less on the opportunity, the chance to make a difference in somebody's life every day. By a show of hands, how many of you guys have ever had somebody make your day by saying one nice thing to you? Look around, everyone in this room. And it can be the silliest thing, right? You can be walking down the hallway and someone's like, hey, nice shirt. You're like, <laughs> this is a nice shirt. Nobody ever notices the niceness of this shirt. And you notice the nice thing. And the rest of the day doesn't matter. Like your principal can come up and be like, oh my gosh, I have the worst news. Your house burned down. And you're like, I don't even care. I have this shirt. I'm good. What else do I need? Now by a show of hands, flip side, how many of you guys have ever had Somebody, some jerk just totally ruined your day by saying one thing. Everyone in here. Everyone in here. Isn't that crazy? And the crazier thing is it can be the same exact thing. You can be walking down the hallway and someone goes, hey, nice shirt. And you're like, thanks. And two seconds later, someone's like, hey, nice shirt. And you're like, I'm so confused about this shirt. <laughs> but you remember that, right? I'm 31 years old in a couple weeks, and I remember specific words that people said to me in high school. I remember specific words that people said to me in middle school, in elementary school, and I don't think that stuff ever leaves you. And the crazy thing is that's the stuff that you and I have the power to do every single day, but how often do we think about that? How often do we focus on making a difference in someone else's life by something that doesn't cost us anything? What does it cost you to tell someone they have a nice shirt? What does it cost you to tell someone that you like their haircut? What does it cost you? Yesterday we were, I was flying uh, to get here, and we're coming down this escalator in the airport, and there's somebody else coming up the escalator, this old lady, and she was wearing these glasses that were orange, and they were like very noticeable. They were very different and like allowed. And I said, hey, I like your glasses, and her face just lit up, and my wife is like, you're a weirdo, stop talking to strangers. <laughs> but I bet that lady went home, and some guy on the airport liked my glasses, this weird looking hippie guy, long hair, I don't know, he's a weirdo, but he liked my glasses. That stuff sticks with us. We remember that stuff years later. You might wonder, why do I talk about this stuff now? I mentioned that I didn't used to talk about this kind of stuff, and now I do. I didn't used to tell people that I wanted to commit suicide when I was a kid. I didn't used to talk about things that weren't funny, and now I do. So what changed? Well, a couple, uh, about 12, 13 months ago, sometime last year, I think it was in February, I was in Wisconsin giving a speech, and I got done, and this girl waited like an hour. Like all These other people, the principal had said, if you want to stay back from class and, and talk to Kyle, you can. And so all these people were just waiting to avoid class. And so at the end of this line, this little girl comes up. She's the tiniest, I mean, she was like, like this big. And um, she would have been in great at my old school. Um, that's called a callback, you're welcome. No, she was a regular sized human, but she was about this tall, skinny, big glasses. And I could tell the second I saw her, like early on, like right after the speech got done, the line started for me, and I could tell she's gonna be the last person to talk to me and it's gonna be big, whatever she says, because she kept waiting. Like, other people would come to get in line and you know, they'd stand behind her and she'd go, no, you can go ahead, it's cool, I don't and then, And she was waiting, she wasn't making eye contact, she wasn't talking to anybody else. I could tell she wants to be alone whenever she tells me what she's gonna say, and that's red flags for me. That sets off red flags, because I've had those discussions where kids come up and say, hey, I'm being abused. Hey, I'm being molested. Hey, I don't know where my dad is. He's been gone for two weeks and we have no idea what's going on. Hey, my dad's an alcoholic. Hey, like, what, like, I've had those conversations. I've had conversations where I had to say, hey guys, everybody else here, if you're here to take a selfie or whatever, to tell jokes and laugh, like, that's great. I have to go call the cops now. I have to go call a hotline. Like, and so when I see this girl walking up, I'm just like buckling up. I'm like, this is that's what it's gonna be. And so I asked her, I look into her eyes, she said, can I ask you a question? I said, yeah, what can I do for you? And she said, um, do you ever worry? Do you ever like have anxiety? And the first thing I thought was, ha, that's not the question, what's the real question? Right, because sometimes that happens to us, right? You, you finally get up the nerve to ask that girl out and you think, you're like, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it. And then you go up and you see her and you're like, no, I'm not, I'm not gonna do it. <laughs> but you already told her you wanted to ask her something and she's like, what do you wanna ask me? And you're like, what's your favorite kind of taco? <laughs> she's like, barbacoa? I don't know, what? <laughs> And I thought that's what happened. I thought this girl had this deep question and then she came up and realized I can't say it. And I was like, think, come on, what's the real question? Because I think, you know, she, do you, do you have anxiety? Do you struggle? And I thought, of course the answer is yes. We all have anxiety, we all have struggle, right? Everyone, everyone worries about stuff. 
all of you guys, you worry. You go to class every day, you walk into school, and when you walk in, man, you've got worries. Some of you guys are worried about your, your girlfriend or boyfriend and whether or not they're really secretly in love with your best friend. Some of you are worried that your friends don't actually like you as much and you might be the butt of the joke. Some of you are worried about your future. Some of you are worried about your finances. Some of you are worried about your test scores. Some, sometimes it's big stuff, it's small stuff, but we all worry about stuff. But what happens? We come into class, we walk in the front door, we just zip that up inside and smile, right? And people say, how are you doing? You go, oh, I'm fine. You're not fine, you liar. And I thought, she knows that. She knows that that's the game that we're all playing, right? And, and then I looked into her eyes and I realized, oh, she, she doesn't actually know that. She doesn't know that. That's the real question. I looked into her eyes and I could see she thought she was the only one. And so I grabbed her in this big hug and I was like, oh my gosh, yes. I said, yeah, I worry. Yes, I, I have anxiety. Yes, I struggle. And I said, you want to know something else? Everybody else does too. Your teachers, your friends, your parents, all the kids who stand, stood in that line in front of you. All the kids who are in this room, every, every person I've ever talked to worries and struggles and has anxiety. I said, you're not alone. And when I said the words, you're not alone, it was like something unlocked in her, like she could breathe again. Like something like a weight lifted off of her. And I realized in that moment, oh, I didn't need to say all that other stuff. I said, you're not alone. And that was all I needed to say. I didn't need to tell her that her parents worried, her friends worried. Her, her, all I needed to tell her was that I do because it only takes one person to make you realize that you're not alone. And I'm one person. I'll close with this story. Um, guys, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm almost out of time here. I, I do wanna say this. They're gonna put up a slide here in a second that has my um, social media stuff on there. I don't really care if you follow me or not. I, I don't care about like how many followers I have, but I do have this stuff. Oh look, that's me. Uh, Instagram specifically, um, so that I can keep in touch with people. Because the thing I love about my job is that I get to travel all over the country. I get to meet cool people from all over the place. I've spoken in 44 or 45 states now. And, the thing that I hate though is that tomorrow I'm gonna to do a workshop in the morning and then I'm gonna get on a plane and I'm gonna fly home and the day after that I'm gonna be speaking somewhere else and two days after that I'm gonna be speaking somewhere else and so I get to plant these seeds and make these connections and then I have to go somewhere else. And so um, I, I do this stuff so that you guys can keep in touch with me. So please follow me if there's everything that I can do. Get in touch. If you're looking for a speaker for your school or something, great, I would love to do that. But even if you just wanna talk, I get messages all the time from kids who go, hey, I saw you at this thing like four years ago. You probably don't even remember, but I, but I just need somebody to talk to. I love that stuff. I answer every email or direct message that I ever get that isn't creepy or weird. <laughs> and the last thing, I'm, I'm gonna ask one thing of you before I go is that, um, and then I'm gonna tell one more story, is that I, I've been doing, this has nothing to do with what I'm talking about. Can you guys get your phones out and turn your flashlights on? Do you have them? Because I've been traveling around the country and I've been collecting videos for this story. Um, I'm trying to get 10,000 people to sing the greatest rock and roll song of all time, Don't Stop Believing. And so every time, more phones, more lights if you got them. Um, and, and so every time I go somewhere, I'm having each audience sing one line of the song and then I'm stitching it all together. My original goal is 10,000 people, but I'm already like way over that. So um, your line for this song is strangers waiting up and down the boulevard. All right, and we're gonna just sing it. I can't sing it because my voice is too close to the microphone, um, but then I'm gonna stitch all this together and I'll post it, all right? So it goes like this. Strangers waiting, pause. Up and down the boulevard. That's it. And then I'll stitch it together for you guys. Okay, let's try this. One, two, three. Strangers waiting up and down the boulevard. Guys, that was really good if you were in a coma. So <laughs> let's try it like three times louder than that. All right, get those lights back up. One, two, three. Strangers waiting. Give yourselves a round of applause. I'll close with this story. By the way, that's where I'll post that on Instagram, is where I'll post that video later. Um, when I was in middle school, I decorated my room with glow-in-the-dark stars because I was super cool. <laughs> No, I didn't do it to be cool. I didn't do it as like a design decision. I did it because I liked sleeping under the stars. Like I used to camp out in the summer and I went to a poor camp so we didn't have tents. We just like lay on the ground and look up at the stars. And it was, there's something magical about that. And I thought, man, if I put glow, like tiny little glow in the dark stars up on my ceiling, I could feel like that every night. And so I put these glow in the dark stars, but I didn't just put them up on the ceiling because like when you go out in the stars, it's not just like there's a square of stars. So I put them on the top half of the wall too, and I did constellations, and I did, like really tried to like put in the time to make it look like you were outside. That plan backfired on me the first night when I woke up and I thought I was outside. <laughs> and I was terrified. <laughs> Actually, I didn't think I was outside. I knew I was outside. I knew for a fact somebody took my bed and put it in the woods. 
And then I quickly realized it had to have been my brothers, right? Like they conspired on this, their rooms are on either side, they probably did it. I didn't think through the fact that they would have had to turn the bed on its side and it would have fallen off. I thought maybe they took the roof off. I don't know how committed they were to this plan, okay? But they took my bed, I'm in the woods, I'm terrified. I can't even see my house from here, I don't even know where I am. It's pitch black, I just see the stars and I'm so scared. But then I quickly realized, oh, you know what? You wouldn't take someone's bed into the woods and leave them there and just leave. Like, that's something like a psychopath would do. What you would do is you would take the bed, leave them there, and then wait until they woke up so you could see them just totally lose their mind. Like, that's what a brother would do. And so I'm like, my brothers, they've got to be like just sitting in the woods, like five or 10 feet away, just hiding out, just waiting. So I started yelling. <laughs> okay, guys, good joke. Good joke. Uh, hey, let's let's turn on those flashlights you got and let's uh, head on back home, please. And no one is answering me. And I'm getting a little bit more scared. And so I'm yelling a little bit louder. I'm like, oh. all right, all right, guys, for real though. Um, it's kind of it's kind of dark out here. This is kind of scary. Uh, I'll be honest with you. I'm terrified right now. Can we just please, can we please come home? <laughs> And nobody's answering, and I'm like, for real, guys, seriously, though. Um, we can leave the bed here, it's okay, we'll come back later for the bed. You don't forget the bed entirely, I'll sleep on the ground the rest of my life, I just want to go home, I know, I'm just good. <laughs> and nobody is answering me, and I'm getting more and more terrified, and I'm feeling more and more alone, and eventually I realize I'm going to have to, no one's here. I can't walk out of here, I've got to run, because... <laughs> Some of you are getting ahead of me. Um... <laughs> I was like, if I walk, I'm gonna wuss out. I'm gonna get two steps and be like, no, 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 okay. You know, I was like, I just gotta commit to this, you know? And so I was like, here I go. <laughs> boom! And I just run straight into the door, just full speed, boom! Face first into the door. It knocked one of the stars off the wall. That's how hard I fell down and I made a wish. Um, <laughs> Somehow me yelling for like five minutes didn't wake anybody up, but me running my face into the door full speed did the job. And my brother in the next room was like, are you okay? And I laid back down and I pulled the covers up and I was like, yeah, man, I'm okay. And I was okay because I realized that I wasn't alone anymore. If you could throw my social media thing, we'll do it one more time. Um, I realized I wasn't alone anymore, and I was okay now. And I know some of you hear that story and you're like, wow, that is a really dumb story. <laughs> because, dude, you were not alone the whole time. And I'm here to say it doesn't matter. It didn't matter to me that I wasn't alone. It didn't matter to me that I wasn't in the woods. I was actually in a house. I was actually as far from the front door as you could get in that house. I was actually surrounded by uh, another, my brother was on one room, you know, on one side of me, my other brother's in the other room. My parents are upstairs. I'm, I'm warm, I'm secure, I'm safe, I'm fine. Because I didn't feel like that, so it didn't matter. And guys, there are people in this room right now, and there are people on your campuses, there are people in your groups, your Skills USA chapters, there are people maybe in your family, in your community, who it doesn't matter that right now to get out of here it's going to be hard because there's a lot of you. It doesn't matter that there's multiple people when you're trying to get to your locker or, or get to the car line or whatever. It doesn't matter that you're just cramming like sardines at sometimes because these people feel like they're all alone. <laughs> And it doesn't matter that you can look at them and tell them what their outfit looks like, what their haircut looks like, what color their skin is or their eyes are, because they feel invisible. And guys, that is not a problem that your principal can solve. And that's not a problem that your Skills USA advisor can solve. And that's not a problem that your, that your council on whatever can solve or some government grant or some group can solve. That's a problem that you can solve. Because it only takes one person to lift someone up. It only takes one person to tear someone down. It only takes one person to make someone's day, and it only takes one person to ruin someone's day. And it just so happens that one person is what you've got to work with. So what are you gonna use your one person for? Guys, I'm all out of time. You've been a fantastic audience. Give yourself a round of applause. Thank you, Mr. Sheely. We would like to remind all contestants and advisors that Arizona's conference attire policy will be in effect at tomorrow's award session. Students coming on stage to receive an award must be in official SkillsUSA attire, general business wear, and our SkillsUSA Arizona apparel, which consists of black or khaki slacks and a polo style shirt. The following will not be allowed. T-shirts, jeans of any type or color, shorts, tennis shoes, and flip-flops. Conference attire will be strictly enforced and students not in proper clothing will not be recognized on stage. 
We will have a leadership session on April 19th with Kyle Sheedy. In addition to the leadership contest, the following activity is available for you to attend tomorrow. You can attend the Arizona Science Center for only $6 with your conference name badge. Detailed information about these activities can, and the conference program can be found at the registration area. We ask advisors to be responsible for their students' behavior during this conference. For those of you who are staying at the Hyatt Hotel, curfew will be strictly enforced at 10 p.m. On behalf of the Skills USA Arizona, good luck and have a wonderful time. This session is now set.